I welcome you back once again to the waning chapters of the book of Genesis, that incomparable book of origins. There is literally no book like it, you know, on the face of the earth. There is nothing like it. It has material that takes us back to the very dawn of creation. And you say, how is that even possible to have material that takes us back to the dawn of creation? Well, if you'll recall, Genesis is made up with a number of source documents. And the key is, whenever you see this phrase, this is the account of. We have the account of Adam. We have the account of Adam's family line. We have the account of Noah. We have the account of Noah's sons. We have the account of Terah's family who is the father of Abraham, the account of Isaac, the father of Jacob. And now here we are, 45 chapters deep, talking about Jacob's 11th son, that famous son, Joseph, the favored son, and the persecuted son, and the exalted son, and the son who typifies in so many ways our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, and how God used him to preserve the family line and to save Many. You know, there is evidence of Egyptian civilization all the way back to 3300 BC. That's how old Egyptian civilization is. In other words, civilization there started around 700 years after creation, if we take a biblical timeline, and I do, I hope you do. Um, One of Noah's grandsons, as a matter of fact, was named Egypt. Uh, And we went over that many months ago. uh, And we assume that he was the founder of Egypt after the Great Flood had destroyed it in the first place, uh, around 2348. And then this uh, grandson of Noah went there as well and reestablished the area. Egyptian civilization is not only very ancient, and very magnificent, it is also very well documented. Extremely well documented, and much of it is preserved to this very day. At least the reestablished Egypt is preserved to this very day. You could spend the rest of your life easily studying ancient Egyptian civilization, culture, religion, architecture, government, language, artwork, And the list goes on and on. And some people do. There are experts in this world who are experts at just one thing, Egyptian civilization, because there is so much to learn. However, when it comes to figuring out the emotional character of an Egyptian, an ancient Egyptian, then suddenly the picture gets very fuzzy. Because ancient Egyptians were a very mysterious lot. And this is no more evident than in the many statues and many representations of the people. Every time you see a picture of an ancient Egyptian, they always appear the same. (laughs) Poker-faced. Just, you know, no emotion. Mysterious. You never know what they're... You look into their faces and you never know exactly what it is that they're thinking. You have no idea. And then there's Joseph who gets dropped into the middle of this ancient civilization, which had been in operation at that time already for about a thousand years, a little under a thousand years by the time he got there, which is a long time for a culture to be going. Almost a thousand years. How long has the American culture been going? The Canadian culture been going? The Egyptian culture was going for almost a thousand years when Joseph gets dropped into the middle of it. And you know what they say. They say that when you live in a place long enough, you become like the people who live there. You ever heard that one before? And my wife and I, having lived in different places in Canada, we can vouch for that, and maybe you can too, that people who live in Ontario are different than people in B.C. (laughs) No offense to anybody. Uh, Here's one for you. People who live in Ottawa are different than people who live in Calgary. People who live in rural Alberta, I live there, are different than people who live in West Vancouver, where I've never lived, but I've been there enough and know a little bit about it. And Joseph experienced this general rule. Because by the time he reveals his true identity to his brothers, 
He had been in Egypt for 22 years, and he had become like the people who lived there. And he turned into this rather mysterious, uh, emotionless, poker-faced man, just like all the rest of the Egyptian men of that day, and particularly the Egyptian leaders of that day. Because as you'll recall in the story, his brothers come to buy food. Uh, and this was a couple years back. And Joseph picked them out of the crowd. Oh yeah, I know. <laughs> and, and even though he picked them out of the crowd, he kept up the mystery of anonymity. And both for himself and to his brothers. And to the Egyptians who were closest to him, they had no idea what was going on between Joseph and this ragtag group of Hebrew men who kept coming around, kept coming around. And Joseph seemed to have this special interest in them, but he kept up the anonymity wall. In all their meetings and all their interviews over two years, Joseph played emotional poker with his brothers with great skill, and there was nothing in his face to give away what he was thinking. But, as our good friend Columbo, Detective Columbo would say, there's just one thing, just one more thing. And that one thing was that Joseph was not an Egyptian. He was a Hebrew in his inner man, in his blood, in his his, uh, his genetics. He was a Hebrew man, and if there's one thing we know about Hebrew people, drawing from Old Testament writings and also from non-biblical Hebrew writings, if there's one thing we know about Hebrew people is that Hebrew people are good at expressing their feelings. They are anything but emotionally constipated. They vent, they express themselves. You never have to guess what a Hebrew person is thinking or feeling. And so even after 22 years of this strong Egyptian influence in Joseph's life, he could not change the fact at a certain point that he was the son of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And in chapter 45, Blah! It all comes out, this bottled up emotions come pouring out. And we've read it a couple of times already. It says in verse 2 that he wept so loudly, so loudly that the Egyptians heard it. I don't know what that means. I I think the the walls shook because of how loud he wept. And the household of Pharaoh heard about it. This was the big story in Memphis, right? Memphis, not Tennessee, but Memphis, the ancient capital of Egypt. This was the big story that an Egyptian leader of Joseph's stature would lose it and give vent to his emotions like that and not be poker-faced. And our text for today is the continuation of this emotional explosion. Verse 14 and 15 says, Then he threw his arms around Benjamin and wept. Benjamin embraced him, weeping, and he kissed all his brothers and wept over them. And afterwards, his brothers talked with him. What a great day that was. What a day. I never grow tired of coming to this point of the story because it's so beautiful, it's so climactic, it's so refreshing, it's a, it's a day of, it's a banner day. It's a day to remember, a day of reunification with his brothers after all these years, a day of salvation, a day that bonded the brothers together like nothing did before. Really, I mean, before they were fighting with each other and And now they're just bonded together through this experience with Joseph. Uh, The 12 tribes of Israel are kind of born on this day. 12 tribes of Israel. Now, what do we, uh, what what can we make of this emotional explosion? Uh, There's four points that I would like to share. Whoops, I don't want to show that yet. There we go. The first thing is that in this emotional explosion, we see Joseph's humanity. I think you'll agree it must have been very tough on Joseph to be in Egypt all those years, separated from his family, separated from all other Hebrew people, surrounded by these mysterious, 
emotionally flat, unsmiling Egyptian people. And, and then he gets scooped up and taken up to the very top echelons of Egyptian society. And he has to play this role. Play this role that was expected of him. Way up there at the top, you can bet your bottom dollar that he was a very lonely man up there. Surrounded by a people that were not his own. And maybe you can relate to that. Especially if you happen to be from someplace else. I think in Canada so many of us are from someplace else. And we are transplanted. <laughs> and we are living among a people that are different than we are. And people are often very, very proficient at covering up their loneliness even when they are immigrants or they are on visitor visas or they are expats, as they call them, or foreigners. But loneliness can be a very overwhelming experience, even when you live in a big city that's teeming with life and teeming with activity and you've got responsibilities. And even if you're like Joseph and outwardly you're very successful at what you do, loneliness can still be a very real issue. And of course, you don't need to be living in a new land in order to sense and feel loneliness. There is great loneliness on every street, every street in Langley. I am convinced of that, and I'll bet you are as well. And the so-called social media is no answer to that. Often it just makes the loneliness worse. So now we come to this little video it was the second day that we were in New Zealand and we were at a place called Sumner Beach which is on the outskirts of Christchurch and we were enjoying the sound of the gentle waves with our ice cream cones soaking in the evening sunshine and yes I'm rubbing it in because it was snowing over here. <laughs> and little Claire, our two-year-old granddaughter, had wandered off with Aunt Esther and when we looked up, we saw her crawling around on her hands and knees next to a little girl we'd never seen before. And Esther caught what was happening on video, and it's so priceless. And I'll, you'll have to turn the sound up really quite high, uh, Capoto, in order to hear what she says. <laughs> Did you catch that? Do it one more time. I'm making a friend. So, that's how to do it. How do you make a friend? You get down on all fours. What I mean is you get down to that person's life, that person's level, and you crawl through the sand of life with them. I'm making a friend. And we are motivated, we should be motivated to make a new friend when we think about Joseph's humanity and his loneliness. The second thing that we see in Joseph's emotional explosion is we see a great love for his brothers. We already read the text, verses 14 and 15. On the one hand, you and I would say that Joseph's love for his brothers is a very natural thing. It's to be expected. But on the, on the other hand, maybe not. It's a, it's a very noteworthy thing. It's a very praiseworthy thing about Joseph that he would love his brothers like this. Because how many people having experienced what Joseph experienced to be betrayed by his brothers, to be sold by his brothers, literally sold for 20 pieces of silver, um, to have his pleas for mercy completely ignored, and I can never forget that image in my mind of him turning around while he's chained up to the Ishmael traders and they're taking him to Egypt and he's turning around looking at his brothers. I can never forget that picture in my mind. And then to be abandoned to a life of slavery in a foreign land. I mean, how many people would be consumed by bitterness? 
Or as I put it last week, how many would have, when, when seeing his brothers again, how many of us would have been exploding with rage and blame? You know, I hate you, I hate you, you stole my youth, you took away my freedom, all those years I spent as a slave, all those years in that dungeon, do you have any idea what that was like? You did all this to me and I'm going to make you pay. You know, that kind of response is not very hard to imagine, but that was not Joseph's response. And the question should be, why did he not respond like that? Why was it that Joseph did not allow his horrible past, his horrible past, to get the best of him when he saw his brothers again? And the answer, of course, is that through it all, Joseph had been drawing near to God. You can't be close to God and have a hardened heart at the same time. The two are mutually exclusive. You can't be close to God and then be unforgiving at the same time. Because love is one of God's primary attributes. And God is the undisputed source of love. The Bible goes so far as to say whoever does not love does not know God. Because God is love. And if, you're, if you let your heart get hardened you will begin to drift from God. And if you drift from God, your heart will get hardened. But if you draw near to God, as Joseph did, you'll start to see that everything that happens in your life, as we talked about last week, whether good things, bad things, or ugly things, you start to see that God is sovereign, and God is good, and God ordains things to happen in order to bring about a greater good. And if you rest in that peace, then God will keep your heart soft and he makes it possible for you to be a channel of his love for others despite the circumstances. And so we see great love. We also see a remarkable forgiveness. The text says that he begins with Benjamin which was a very natural place for Joseph to begin because Benjamin was, was the only brother who was younger than Joseph. In fact, it's very difficult to calculate. You, you try to do the calculation about how old was Benjamin when Joseph was shipped off to Egypt. It's hard to arrive at a number, but it seems like he was about 10 or less when Joseph was shipped off. So he was not involved in any way, shape, or form with what happened to Joseph. But in addition, we know that Benjamin was a full brother. He shared the same father and the same mother, his mother Rachel having died while he was being given birth. And so Joseph's weeping starts with Benjamin, but the amazing thing is that it continues all the way around the circle with Simeon and with Levi and with Reuben and with Judah, all the ones in particular who had been responsible for his slavery. So we're looking at a picture of love, but we're looking at a picture of love that has been married to grace. What is forgiveness? Forgiveness is love married to grace. And that's what Joseph was expressing to his brothers. Their father, Jacob, did not have very nice things to say about Simeon and Levi. When he distributed the blessings at the end of his life, he described them like this. He said, Simeon and Levi are brothers. Their swords are weapons of violence. Let me not enter into their council. Let me not join their assembly. For they have killed men in their anger and hamstrung oxen as they pleased. Cursed be their anger, so fierce, their fury so cruel. I will scatter them in Jacob and disperse them in Israel. It's not a very good character reference that these two brothers are getting from their dad. Even so, even so, Joseph reaches out in love and grace and forgiveness to embrace all of them, including these two. Just like Jesus Joseph is acting just like Jesus. He's one of the 
dozens of ways in which Joseph is a typology of Christ. The example of Joseph's forgiveness in this, in this particular place here is an example that is only second to the example of our Lord. Judas betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver, and yet as they were having the Lord's Supper together, Jesus offers Judas the piece of bread that's been dipped into gravy, which was the best piece, as a special favor. And then a few hours later in the Garden of Gethsemane, Judas comes to formally betray him, and Jesus did not turn his cheek away, which we would from the one who kissed it. When the soldiers came to crucify him, Jesus cried out, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. Peter, the disciple whom we read about this morning, denied him three times, but he was reinstated by our, our Lord three times when he said, feed my lambs, take care of my sheep, feed my sheep. In that whole chapter that Dale read, there was no hint of a grudge, no hint or a shadow of anything negative, just pure love and forgiveness. And that, my brothers and sisters, is the Jesus presented in the scriptures. That's the Jesus who lives today. That's the Jesus who reaches out to you and to me. For you have betrayed him and I have betrayed him. You have offended him and I have offended him. In fact, we have done more against our Savior over the course of our lifetime than Joseph ever managed to do or have done to him by his brothers. And yet Jesus is the most loving, kind, forgiving, gentle friend of sinners that could ever be. The servant of the Lord is the servant of all. And even a bruised reed he will not break, a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. The love and grace and forgiveness of Joseph must be multiplied exponentially when we consider the deep, deep love of Jesus. Vast, unmeasured, boundless, and free. And lastly, in Joseph's emotional explosion, we see a great wisdom. Because the text concludes, afterwards his brothers talked with him. That was a very important talk that they had. Joseph wanted to have this talk because he wanted to reassure his brothers. He knew that they would need this talk. Joseph had had two years to process this business, but these men just got the shock of their life when he says, I am Joseph. Came like a bolt of lightning from a clear blue sky. The very brother that they thought they had shipped off into slavery and who had undoubtedly died somewhere along the last 22 years, here he was standing right there in front of them and in a position of great power. I am certain that the brothers of Joseph were non-smokers, blood pressure 120 over 80, exercising often, watching their triglycerides carefully, non-diabetics, because otherwise they would have all dropped dead of a heart attack when that happened. They knew what they had done, and they were terrified of it. So terrified that even many years later, after Joseph had forgiven them, after they, all the brothers had moved to Egypt to be with Joseph, after their father had moved there and died, at the very end of the book of Genesis, we still find them afraid of Joseph and afraid that he's going to have his day, going to have his revenge. And so Joseph has to reassure them in the last few verses of Genesis 50 all over again. But there was great wisdom for Joseph to sit down and talk with his brothers, to talk it all through, to let them know of his love, to let them know of his forgiveness and that his love and forgiveness were permanent and wasn't going to change. And as we look to our Lord, he did the same. After his resurrection, Jesus did not take the first escalator to heaven. The Bible says he spent 40 days with his disciples talking, 
talking it all through, reassuring them of his love, going over all the things that he had taught them, explaining how it was necessary for him to suffer all these things and then to enter into his glory. And that was important for the disciples too because just like the brothers of Joseph, they had a lot of guilt and a lot of uncertainty. They had blown it. They had abandoned him. They had run away. They had denied him. But we see once again that our Lord is so gentle in the way that he deals with those who have fallen. Number three, even a bruised reed he will not break. A bruised reed he will not break. A smoldering wick he will not snuff out. How wonderful is this picture? How wonderful is this news? Reach out to him. Don't say, I can't. Never say, he won't receive me. He will. No one is beyond his love. There's only one more thing to say. And that is, if we will learn this one thing, what we need to do is take the four points of this message and reposition them. Because the brothers of Joseph are like the people who enter the church. People who enter the church are guilty, lost, confused, terrified, stressed, and they need to be healed in Jesus' name. When he was preaching about the story of Joseph, Martin Luther wrote, The church is a place where people who feel the affliction of sin and death and terror and a wounded conscience are healed. Is our church like that? Are we the kind of people like Joseph who have the character of Jesus who, number one, show our humanity without fear. Show our humanity, not trying to cover it up. Who show the love of God to everyone who comes in. To show Christ's forgiveness that is love married to grace. And who show true wisdom in dealing with people in need. This is our calling. This is our calling as the church to welcome in Christ's name the bruised reeds. The smoldering wicks. The torn. The hurt. The wounded. And so we are to be like Christ in this world, for this world, to this world. It's our privilege and it's our joy to do that for Jesus' sake. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you once again for the example that Joseph has set for us. But Lord, behind Joseph we see even a greater example and that is the example of your very self how you loved, how you forgave, how you showed your humanity, and how you used great wisdom in dealing with everyone that came to you. So we pray that you would work in us and help us to be like you. Help us to be the kind of people that we need to be for those that we are surrounded with. And so we ask you to give us the character of our Lord, that we would, uh, that same character that we saw in Joseph, Let that character be in us as well. We pray this in Jesus' name.